What is going on, everybody? It's your boy Clint from the Die Hard MMA Podcast, and this is the undefeated post-weigh-in show brought to you by Pub Sports Radio. Make sure you hit that like button, share, and subscribe. This is our last opportunity to look at these UFC warriors before they step into the cage tomorrow morning for us, and we try to get every single little nugget of information we can to lock in some final bets and see if we can't make a little extra money. So I watch the weigh-ins from start to finish. I monitor every single fighter as they come up. I watch for just a little waver on the scale. I watch for the rapid blinking of the eyes. I look for the hollow soul trying to find and see if maybe somebody had a bad weight cut or isn't quite sharp for these fights going in at the last second. And then I bring that information to you. So let's get started. First fight up, we've got Impa Kasagne taking on Sasha Palatnikov. Both men came in at 170 and a half pound. Now Impa Kasagne, he got up there and honestly, this is his first time at 170. It's a little concerning. He was absolutely shredded, but a little too sucked out for my liking. He did take a couple of big deep breaths. Now Sasha, I mean not Sasha, Impa Impa is a very, very calm, cerebral type of man, so I'm not entirely sure that that is something that we should take as a red flag here, but this could not be a, a easy weight cut for him. He did make it, and when he got off the scale, he moved okay, so I'm taking that as a good sign. Now, Sasha Platnikov, this dude's shredded. He looks good, he works well at this weight class, and he seems to have it down making his weight. When they faced off, Sasha's actually a decent bit bigger than Impa. That's something that I wasn't quite expecting. I thought that Impa was going to be a little bit bigger, a little bit more imposing, and would uh, kind of show off a little bit here down at the new weight class. They had a good, respectful face-off, which with Impa, you're only ever getting a respectful face-off. Like I said, very calm, very cerebral, this man. So I currently have a half-unit shot on Impa by knockout because Sasha blocks a whole bunch of punches with his face. But... But my initial lean on this one was just taking the under two and a half at about plus 180 or so, and I may actually still go ahead and throw a unit on that, especially seeing the face-offs. I thought Impa was going to be bigger. I thought he was going to be more imposing. The fact that dropping a weight class, cutting all that extra weight out, and his opponent is still larger than he is, and you've got a guy in Sasha who is looking to prove everybody wrong one more time. He's looking to come out and do some damage. Impa coming off of a short turnaround and a knockout recently. The under two and a half may be the better play. I might be... uh, reaching a little bit for that knockout prop because of the extra value but the under two and a half might be the spot and that's a play that I may still tack on to my card here second fight of the night Daun Jung taking on William Knight both guys came in at 205 pounds and a half Daun Jung not a whole lot to report he looked fine he's not the most physically impressive guy there on the scale but he's pretty damn big William Knight on the other hand I talk about it every time this dude's a brick shit house holy crap like i have no idea how this much muscle fits on one human's frame biggest flex in the house today when they faced off huge size difference i mean william knight comes about to the hips of da un jung and you might be like man i'm gonna take the tall long guy i actually think that's a positive i think william knight's gonna be able to close the distance he's already at the hips, I mean, he's staring at the chest of Da Un Jung. It's going to be really easy for him to get that body lock. And I think that type of size and positioning, he'll be able to pin him up against the fence and hold him. And I think that Da Un Jung is going to have a real hard time moving William Knight around, especially in the small cage. I'm on William Knight already. I got in early. I got a bad line. William Knight is now plus 115, plus 120. I like him as an underdog. I'm not going to double down on him or anything like that, I don't think. But I still like William Knight here in this spot. And I think this is going to be a pretty damn good fight. Luis Saldana taking on Jordan Griffin. Both guys came in at 145 and a half. Lots of matching weights today so far. Saldana came in looking intense. Good shape. Nice flex. He looked ready to go. And that was uh, something that... I kind of was leaning to the Griffin side originally, seeing how good he looked at the weigh-ins. Definitely kind of pulls me a little bit away from that. Now, Jordan Griffin on the other side, he's in excellent shape. He's absolutely shredded. I think he understands that this is kind of a stepping stone spot for him. This might be a ride or die spot for Griffin. If he doesn't get this win, he could be in jeopardy of losing his UFC roster slot because he's just inching down the rankings at this point. And when they start using you against Dana White Contender Series guys that... Nobody's overly hyped about there's always the chance that you're just going to get the cut. So I think he comes in correct here and knows what he's up against. These guys sized up really well. Good, solid face-off. Once again, I've got a sprinkle. I've got the half unit on Griffin by submission at 5-1. to one. 
I think that's my only spot here on this one. I might look at the under two and a half again. Both these guys are coming for blood. Both these guys are going to push the pace, and maybe that's the better way to go. I do lean to the Griffin side, but the way Sasha looked, he looks like he's out to put on a show himself. So the under two and a half, that violence bet that I talked about on the uh, total show, that may still be a good way to take this one. Hunter Azure taking on Jack Shore. Azure came in at 135 and a half, looked absolutely jacked, and boy, was he doing crazy as He was up there. Yeah, that, he's ready to go. He's ready to prove some people wrong here. Jack Shore came in at 136, and he stepped on and off the scale a little bit gingerly. That's the kind of tell that we're looking for. That's the kind of tell that when you're cutting weight and it's tough and it's bad on you, you lose that balance. You lose that ability to judge where you should be stepping and where your foot should go. So that's a little bit of a red flag for me. But beyond that, he looked good. When they got to each other for the face-off, Shore's slightly bigger. We knew that was going to be the case. And it was another good, respectful face-off. This is one I don't really plan on having much action on. I've got a sprinkle on Shore in round three at 11-1 to one because I think there's a half-decent shot. He just out-gas tanks Hunter Azure and gets that late finish. Uh, but that's about it. That's all I've got for you. And based on how Hunter Azure looked at the weigh-ins, Again, we know that cardio issue is there, so I don't want to buy in on Hunter Azure just because he looked intense, just because he looked good, and I think he's bringing the heat. If Jack Shore gets out of round one, I still expect Hunter Azure to fade off, so I don't want to put my money on him. Next up, we've got Jorgen DeCastro taking on Georgie Stanho. Uh, Jorgen DeCastro came in at 261 and a half. Classic big boy, big old flabby heavyweight coming up there on the scales. Business as usual. Georgie Stanho came in at 255 and a half, and they call this guy the Man Mountain for a freaking reason. I'm pretty sure he's got some help with his strength and conditioning program, if you know what I mean. The guy is built insanely he looked really good on the scales but we haven't seen him in the cage just because you've got muscles it doesn't necessarily translate to being a good fighter when they faced off Georgie Stano was actually a decent bit bigger and that was something again that kind of surprised me I thought these guys would be about the same size I thought that Jorgen DeCastro might have a little bit of a size advantage but Dan Ho being the bigger guy this really feels like a dogger pass spot the more I look at it because uh, even though I think that Jorgen DeCastro is the better fighter, all Dan Ho does is press his opponents up against the cage, clinch them, drag them around, try and slow the pace of the fight down. We've seen that work well against Jorgen DeCastro already with him being the bigger, more than likely stronger guy. I don't see why he can't do it. I think the leg kicks of Jorgen DeCastro might be a problem. So if Georgie Stanho can't close the distance, then he's going to be in trouble. But we're in the small cage. I think he's got the opportunity to close the distance. Um, Georgie Stanho, by decision, just a crazy long shot underdog. I'm, I'm a little tempted to sprinkle, but I, I'm not going to touch that one because there's so many questions. Both guys are so inconsistent. And uh, like I said, DeCastro is the better fighter, so I don't necessarily really want to go against him. Next up. We've got John McDessie taking on Ignacio Bahamondes. John McDessie is 153 pounds and a half. Came in well under the 155 pound limit. No issues making weight there. He's a professional. He's a veteran. And honestly, he's pretty small for the division. So it doesn't surprise me that he came in a little light. Um, big flex. Looked good on the scales. And then Ignacio came in and he required the box of shame, folks. He missed weight. 156 and three quarters. So he could not quite get down to 156 pounds. He was absolutely shredded though the dude is huge for the weight class he had big time abs a good flex and when they faced off the size difference that's the story here right the height and the reach of Bahamondes is the real story John was not phased though Macdessi was right there ready to go had his arms behind his back we all know that's the sign for war ever since Street Jesus blessed us with that one so I think this is going to be a good fun fight. I'm not ready to lay the 2-1 to one on Bahamondes, although I do think he's probably the side here. Bigger, younger, taller, longer. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say that he wins the fight, but I understand people taking the stab on McDessie as an underdog. Norma Dumont versus Aaron Blanchfield, unfortunately, has been pulled. Norma Dumont missed weight in a big way, and she didn't look great on the scale. She's had trouble cutting down to this weight class multiple times in the past. She's a 145er. She really belongs there. She's one of those in-betweeners where it's too hard for her to get down to 135, but she's a little undersized at 145. Not sure what's going on, but because of that bad weight miss, we're never going to get the answer to our question. I was kind of pulling for Aaron Blanchfield. I was hoping she'd come in and get the dang thing done, even being a smaller fighter going up a weight class. Um, honestly, I hope they give her a real fight her next time around in her proper weight class so we can actually see her shine. But uh, yeah, that one's off the card. So next up, we've got Scott Hot Sauce Holtzman taking on Mateus Gamrot. Scott came in at 155.5 and, and Gamrot came in at 156. 
Holtzman had the dead eyes, folks, and this is something I always look for. You see just no soul on these fighters. When the weight cut is rough, when the weight cut is bad, you can tell. You can see the fire in the eyes of the fighters who, even though the weight cuff was a little tough, they're still ready to rock. With this one, there was nothing. The window to the soul, folks, and there was nothing for Scott Holtzman there. He's an absolute unit, though. The dude is jacked, and I have no idea how he makes 155 pounds. Gamrod, on the other hand, intense. Big flex, shredded, well-muscled. I mean, this guy, he, he's not as big and as strong as Holtzman is. He's more suited for the weight class. He's a little leaner, but because of that, he doesn't have as tough of a weight cut, and he looks ready to rock. So when they faced off, they sized up extremely well, and really just that extra bulk on Scott Holtzman is the story of this one for the difference. I like Mateus Gamrot in this spot. I am extremely tempted to just lay the heavy chalk on him, especially seeing Holtzman being kind of checked out at the weigh-ins at 37 years old. That weight cut cannot be getting any easier. Coming off a knockout loss and then facing a guy who's gas tank and wrestling is the story. I like Gamrot here, but I'm not quite sure what to do with him from a betting perspective. Jim Miller taking on Joe Selecki. Uh, both guys came in at 155 and a half and Jim gave a big flex. He looked good on the scale. He just keeps doing the dang thing. And Joe Selecki came in. He's in good shape. He moved well. He also provided us with a nice flex and it was a good, solid, respectful face off. Neither of these guys have any beef or troubles. This is another one of those ones where I, I don't like how wide the line is. I think Joe Selecki should be the fighter that gets it done here. He's younger. He's probably a little bit better than Jim Miller, but at the same time, Jim is that savvy veteran. We've seen him snap people off before and and uh, yeah, really close fight. I'm not going to touch this one from a betting perspective, but it should be sure as heck fun to watch. Mike Platinum Perry came in at 170 pounds, folks. Championship weight for Mike Platinum Perry. Everybody thinking my boy was going to get on there and look terrible on the scales and miss weight again. He looked excellent. He got his crap together. He looked fantastic on the scales today. And in fact, he was the third one to the scales, so he weighed in early to make a statement. Daniel Rodriguez came in at 170 and a half, and he seemed... Uh, he seemed a little deflated. He looked good on the scales, but you know, I talked about the dead eyes of Scott Holtzman. I kind of got the sign from Daniel Rodriguez that he had no interest in being there. Now, don't get me wrong. I know all these fighters are cutting weight. They're unhappy. They don't like the position they're in. Of course, they don't want to be there. Why would, why would they? But, but this really, I just got this weird muted vibe from him. There was no energy. There was no emotion. There was nothing. And then when they faced off, Mike Perry was sizing him up. Mike Perry got up in his face. He was looking him up. He was looking him down. He was mean mugging, getting in close on him, which Mike Perry is known to do. And uh, to Daniel Rodriguez's credit, I mean, he didn't flinch. It was pretty intense face off. But at the same time, I don't know. We didn't get that great of a performance from Daniel Rodriguez last time out. And I'm not getting any vibes from him that he really wants to be here. So, I'm very curious to see what's going to happen here. I've got a bet on Mike Platinum Perry. I beat the line moved by a big chunk. I'm looking forward to this one. I think he shows us a new dedicated 2.0 version of himself, and I'm ready to rock here. Next up, we've got Nina Nunez taking on Mackenzie Dern. That's right. Nina Ansarov has officially changed her last name. She is Mrs. Nina Nunez, and that carries some weight. 116 pounds she came in. No issues first time on the scales after having the baby, and she looks fantastic. She is bricked up as my boy. MMA Kelton would say she looked good she looked ready to go Mackenzie Dern came in at 115 and she looked fantastic she gave her usual one arm flex I was hoping that she would struggle on the scales just a little bit for the sake of my bet but unfortunately she came in on point she did just fine now when they faced off something that I didn't realize was the size advantage for Nina Nina is a decent chunk larger than Mackenzie Dern now we talk all the time about wrestlers having the advantage with the lower center of gra gravity things like that so usually you'd think that'd be an advantage but Dern can't wrestle Dern can't wrestle for crap. She's landed one takedown. She's like one of 18 or 19 on her takedowns in the UFC. She can't grapple. So honestly, that doesn't concern me at all. And I think the size and the reach advantage that Nina is going to enjoy because of that um, is only more of a positive for her. I've got Nina at minus 115. I've got two, or sorry, minus 110. I've got 2.2 units on her. It's my biggest bet on the card. I love this spot for her. Taking my opportunity one more time to fade Mackenzie Dern. All she's got to do is not go to the ground with her. And I think we're going to get the dub. 
Next up, we've got Smiling Sam Alvey taking on Julian Marquez. Both guys came in at 186 pounds. Smiling Sam Alvey looked good. He gave a bunch of different flexes up there like he was on some kind of a body show. Big smiles, moving well. I mean, he looks good. He looked fantastic. I know 185 is not an easy cut for him, but he seemed at home when he got up there today, and he didn't have any trouble showing off or anything like that while he was on the scale, so no concerns here for me. Julian Marquez, he needed the box of shame. Now, he did make 186, so it's not like he had like a really bad weight cut or something. In fact, he was given a full promo for his Twitch stream with the video games on the scale right afterward. Um, he moved very well around there, which that always kind of sketches me out. I know he's trying to promote himself as much as humanly possible, but it's almost like Tyrone Woodley with all these other skews that he's got going on. I got to wonder just how much is he really dedicated to the fight game at this point, especially after his long layoff. I know he's trying to set himself up for later in life that is smart not enough MMA fighters do that these days but at the same time Julian Marquez seems to be tipping just a little too far to the uh, self-promotion side that I'm concerned with his dedication to the actual fight part of the game now when they sized up Sam Alvey's got a decent size advantage this is something we were looking at this is something we were talking about that Sam Alvey is for the first time in four years going to be bigger than his opponent he's going to have a height and a reach advantage over his opponent Marquez here and I think that makes a difference and I think Sam Alvey is somehow getting under Julian Marquez's skin in an interview Marquez talked about how Sam Alvey is evil and he sees right through what he's showing off on there when they got up and they faced off Sam Alvey all the dude does is smile he's just always happy he's in a good mood I love it and his smile seemed to piss off Julian Marquez. It was hilarious. Like, they got up there. Sam does his classic big old... And you could immediately see Marquez's face lock up. Like, I think Sam is unknowingly winning the mental warfare portion of this fight. I think he's he's in Julian Marquez's head, and Sam doesn't even realize it. Like, he's not trying to do this. This is not the game that he plays. It's not what he does, and somehow he's already winning it. So, this is a spot that, honestly, I, I was looking at the under for this fight, and then I talked about the durability of both fighters, and I decided to pass on that. I'm kind of interested in Sam Alvey. I'm not sold on Julian Marquez. He was a hyped-up prospect. He went away for a long time. He was getting his ass beat by Maki Patolo until he flipped the script in the third round. And yeah, you could talk ring rust. You could say that that was, you know, something that he was just away for so long. You're going to expect him to come back slow. But he's a guy that's a pressure fighter. He comes forward. He comes forward constantly. And Sam Alvey being the bigger, stronger dude looking to counter strike at 185 where he belongs, that power should translate more. I I'm extremely tempted to roll the dice on my guy Sam Alvey here. You can get him about plus 150, plus 160 around the market at this point. And I know that's not a great price price tag but I'm still just not sold on Julian Marquez so that's a spot that I'm I'm really eyeballing after seeing how good Sam looked at 185. Arnold Allen taking on Sadiq Youssef in our co-main event. Allen came in at 145 and a half gave a good flex looking sharp moved around really well. Sadiq Youssef came in at 146. This dude was calm that quiet confidence that always just speaks volumes to me that's something that he has every time I see him. Good face-off. Arnold is slightly bigger, but Sadiq is never backing down from anybody. This is a great fight. And, I mean, this is one of those ones where both guys come in on point, ready to rock, ready to go. I already couldn't really decide between them. I lean towards Sadiq Youssef, but getting plus 130 on Arnold Allen doesn't sound like a bad option either. These guys are both so good. It's going to be a great fight. I'm going to still stick with Youssef. But at the same time, I can't really suggest anybody bet on this fight. I don't have a good read on who's actually going to win it. I think whoever does win is going to make it look like they're a minus 250, minus 300. I mean, if Sadiq knocks out Allen, then we're going to know. And it's going to look like he should have been a much bigger favorite. But if Allen is able to grind Sadiq on the floor, pin him up against the fence, maybe even choke him out, he's going to look like a minus 200 or a minus 250 in, in hindsight. So this is one of those ones where it just comes down to the game script, and I'm more than willing to just sit back and watch. So I'm going to say Sadiq Youssef wins this fight, but no bet for me. Main event time. Marvin Vittori. The Italian Dream taking on Big Mouth Kevin Holland, who is not so big mouth anymore. Marvin Vittori came in at 186, and this dude is always in great shape. Like, he's just, that's one of the reasons why I like him so much, is he is just always in excellent condition. He was first to the scale, showing off a little bit, really feeling himself here. And then Kevin Holland came in at 183 and a half. Now, we know he really belongs at 170, but he's been fighting up a weight class because he can. And uh, he always comes in a little bit light, even on the quick turnaround. The dude doesn't need to cut weight. So, you know, not really sure what to make of that here, but he's going to be a little bit undersized. Now, 
Ke- Kevin Holland looked good. He looked fantastic on the scales. He doesn't look like a guy that went back and sat on the couch and ate ice cream for two weeks. Like He looks like he got right back in the gym and he took care of himself. So I'm not worried about his gas tank or anything like that in this particular fight. And the weird thing is he was silent. Everyone gave him so much crap for talking during the fight. Everyone gave him so much crap for being a showman and and being over the top that he didn't say a word. And honestly, it was unsettling because I've been watching this guy fight for years now and seeing him on the scales, mouth shut, zipped, not a word, staring. You can see the burning in his eyes. This man has a chip on his shoulder coming into this fight on Saturday and it kind of freaked me out a little bit. Quiet Kevin Holland may be our new mythical fighter. Let's see if he can pull off the upset on Saturday because if he does... Quiet Kevin Holland will march right up there with Humble Nganu, Sea Level Kane, like all those legendary fighters that we talk about. Uberim, like he will, he will notch his place in MMA history if he pulls this upset without being the big mouth on Saturday. When they faced off, both guys were fired up. I mean, Vittori, he's always a rage monster. He gets up there doing this thing. His veins are popping out of his neck, going nuts. Holland was just rubbing his hands. I mean, he he just looked like a sniper, just waiting for his opportunity. He looked like a killer. He can't wait to get in there. And Vittori being thicker is really my concern here because I expected Holland to be a little taller, have a height and reach advantage here, but they sized up really well. And based on their body types, I mean, Vittori, he was almost matching him in height. And then he's just thick as hell he's just so well muscled and that's the problem for me is I really want to back Kevin Holland here I want to take that shot I think that with his new mental state with how angry he is I want to see him go out there and do the dang thing and pull off the upset and go you know just absolutely light the world on fire like that's what I want to see happen but the size of Vittori is stopping me because we were able to see Holland get ground out in his last fight by an opponent that I I don't put on the same level as Vittori. I love Vittori. I think this guy is future title contender worthy. And with how much bigger and thicker he is, you know, my concern was the takedown volume. I think Vittori is going to want to play on the feet and strike with Holland. But if Holland clips him and can't quite put him out, Vittori is going to change it up and go to the grappling instead. And with just that difference in power, that difference in strength, I can see him going straight back to the grinded out wrestling game. And I don't know that Holland is going to have much of an answer for that because of the size difference. So I'm tempted to throw a flyer on this underdog here. I mean, he's gotten out of control. He's all the way up to plus 280 in certain places, which that seems a little excessive to me. But more than that, I'm extremely tempted to play the under in this fight. I talked about it before and it was one that kind of had me a little bit intrigued, but I didn't think I wanted to pull the trigger. After going back and listening to the interviews with both these guys and especially seeing the attitude that Kevin Holland has, I don't think this fight's going to last long. Kevin Holland is talking about going there and going out straight to deal business. He wants to go out and he wants to make a statement. He talked about taking off Vittori's head. So you know his game plan is to strike. You know his game plan is to go out there and land some kind of big flashy knockout and get out of there as soon as possible. Now, if he does that, I'll Obviously, the under is going to catch. If he doesn't do that, Marvin Vittori is far more aggressive than Derek Brunson is. If Marvin Vittori gets on top of him, he's going to look to beat him to a pulp. He's going to look to get a dominant position and look for a choke. We have seen Kevin Holland submitted before. Now, nobody's been able to knock this guy out, but he's also never been in a position where the referee needed to save him. And I think Marvin Vittori's ground and pound could be the kind of spot that requires a referee to step in and stop it, even if he doesn't go unconscious. So more so than before, I'm now thinking that the under four and a half is really not a bad play here because Vittori is amped up and he is ready to kill this guy and Holland is coming out to push the pace and make a statement given that he's in such a violent mindset that will cause Vittori to one-up him on the other side because if Kevin Holland hits him early and has the opportunity for the finish Marvin Vittori is going to have to turn the tables and fight for his life and if he has to do that I think there's a chance he can get the finish himself all of a sudden that under four and a half is really starting to look nice to me the under three and a half is the alternate line minus 125 for the under three and a half rather than paying the minus 160 I don't know if I like that quite as much because, uh, I mean, at the same time, I'm expecting this fight to end in like the second or the third round. So that gives you an extra half round there, but paying the extra juice to make sure that if it goes to round five, you're still alive on this thing. I don't hate that whatsoever. The under four and a half may be a spot that I add to my card. That is the undefeated post weigh-in show, folks. I'm sorry I didn't have a whole ton of action for you this week, but the fighters either came in looking good and on point, didn't change my opinion of anything, or the fighters that came in and didn't look great, 
I already wasn't interested in betting on them or the fight got canceled. So there wasn't a whole lot of action here for me to really pinpoint and give you a perfect spot that I really like. But there are a couple spots I like already on the card. Very intrigued to see how we do. Good luck on all your action. We will see you on Monday right here, Pub Sports Radio, for the Die Hard MMA podcast next week. Good luck and let's roll.